Part 1. Underground. I'm a sick man. I'm a spiteful man. I'm an attractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. However, I know nothing at all about my disease and don't know for certain what ails me. I don't consult a doctor for it and never have, though I have respect for medicine and doctors. Besides, I'm extremely superstitious, sufficiently so to respect medicine anyway. I'm well educated enough not to be superstitious, but I am superstitious. No, I refuse to consult a doctor from spite, that you probably will not understand. Well, I understand it though. Of course, I can explain who it is precisely that I'm mortified in this case by my spite. I am perfectly well aware that I cannot pay out the doctors by not consulting them. I know better than anyone that by all this I'm only injuring myself, no one else. But still, if I don't consult the doctor, it's from spite. My liver is bad, well, let it get worse. I've been going on like that for a long time, 20 years, now I'm 40. Used to be in the government service, but I'm no longer. I was a spiteful official, I was rude and took pleasure in being so. I didn't take bribes, you see, so I was bound to find a recompense in that, at least. Poor jest, but I will not scratch it out. I wrote it thinking it would sound very witty. Now that I have seen myself that I only want to show off in a despicable way, I will not scratch it out on purpose. When petitioners used to come for information to the table at which I sat, I used to grin my teeth at them and felt intense enjoyment when I succeeded in making anybody unhappy. Almost did succeed. For the most part they were all timid people. Of course they were petitioners. But of the uppish ones there was one officer in particular I couldn't endure. He simply wouldn't be humble. Clunk his sword in a disgusting way. I carried on a feud with him for eighteen months over that sword. At last I got the better of him. He left off clunking it. That happened in my youth, though. But do you know, gentlemen, what was the chief point about my spite? Well, the whole point, the real sting of it lay in the fact that continually, even in the moment of the acutest spleen, I was inwardly conscious with shame that I wasn't only not a spiteful but not even an embittered man. I was simply scaring sparrows at random and amusing myself by it. I might form in the mouth but bring me a dough to play with, give me a cup of tea with sugar in it and maybe I should be appeased. Might even be genuinely touched, though probably I should grin my teeth at myself afterwards and lie awake at night with shame for months after. That was my way. I was lying when I said just now that I was a spiteful official. I was lying from spite. I was simply amusing myself with the petitioners and with the officer, and in reality I never could become spiteful. I was conscious every moment in myself of many, very many elements absolutely opposite to that. I felt them positively swarming in me, these opposite elements. I knew that they had been swarming in me all my life and craving some outlet from me, but I wouldn't let them, would not let them purposely, would not let them come out. They tormented me till I was ashamed. They drove me to convulsions and sickened me at last, how they sickened me. Now, I'm not all fancying, gentlemen, that I am expressing remorseless for something now that I am asking your forgiveness for something. I'm sure you are fancying that, however, I assure you I do not care if you are. It wasn't only that I could not become spiteful, I didn't know how to become anything, neither spiteful nor kind, neither a rascal nor an honest man, neither a hero nor an insect. Now, I'm living out my life in my corner, taunting myself with this spiteful and useless consolation that an intelligent man cannot become anything seriously, and it is only the fool who becomes anything. Yes. A man in the nineteenth century must and morally ought to be preeminently a characterless creature, a man of character. An active man is preeminently a limited creature. That is my conviction of forty years. I'm forty years old now. As you know, forty years is a whole lifetime. You know, it is extreme old age. To live longer than 40 years is bad manners, the vulgar and the moral. Who does live beyond 40? As for that, sincerely and honestly, I will tell you who do, fools and worthless fellows. I tell old men that to their face, all these venerable old men, all these silver-haired and reverend seniors, tell the whole world that to its face, I have a right to say so, for I shall go on living to 60 myself, to 70, to 80. Say, let me take breath. 
You imagine, no doubt, gentlemen, that I want to amuse you. You're mistaken in that, too. I'm by no means such a mirthful person as you imagine, or as you might imagine. However, irritated by all this bubble, and I feel that you are irritated. You think fit to ask me who I am, then my answer is I am a collegiate assessor. I was in the service that I might have something to eat, and solely for that reason. And when last year a distant relation left me 6,000 rubles in his will, I immediately retired from the service and settled down in my corner. I used to live in this corner before, but now I have settled down in it. My room is a wretched, horrid one in the outskirts of the town. My servant is an old countrywoman, ill-natured from stupidity, and moreover there is always a nasty smell about her. I'm told that the Petersburg climate is bad for me and that with my small means it is very expensive to live in Petersburg. I know all that better than all these sage and experienced counselors and monitors. But I am remaining in Petersburg. I'm not going away from Petersburg. I'm not going away because, yeah, why it is absolutely no matter whether I'm going away or not going away, but what can a decent man speak of with most pleasure? Answer of himself. Also, I will talk about myself.